The guy's asking if he handled it properly. What can I say? No. Welcome, Midswatch, Ryan, how you guys doing? It's uh, being recorded the Christmas season, so I don't know if I'm putting my visuals on here or if it's just going to go like full-on radio audio, but uh, I got the Christmas synth lights in the background to kind of keep us to keep us in the Christmas mood. So this one, it's actually a very important field report. It kind of solidified a lot of things that we had been talking about. It's about six years old as of the time I'm making this video. And for the two years previously that, we were always trying to sort out what the term outcome independence meant. And this is going to be a good example of two things. The first is the difference between outcome dependence and outcome independence and why you'd want to use it. And the second one is why texting is for logistics only, but guy handled it all right. So I'll get right into it. It's pretty short. Uh, the guy here, Red Pill Struggle, been running his map, mail action plan for three months. His uh, sexual market value is the highest it's ever been, which look at three months, you're not fundamentally going to change much other than you feel better because you're making progress. So like, I don't want to deflate people who have been doing it for three months. Just be aware of where you're at. Um, hasn't had sex in over a month. She initiated was great too. He's tried four times in the last three days and no luck. It's just been okay. And no. So she started working out recently. He's been at it for three months. He's been encouraging her. So there's some improvement. She rarely does housework, but she's improving because he's being more assertive about getting things done around the house. She's a stay at home mom. If you guys don't know, he's not telling her to get home from work and start cleaning. Uh, he tease each, we tease each other quite a bit. She's one more touchy feely. Also brings up that uh, I used to be such a slob, and now I've changed. She doesn't even look this. Like, it doesn't even look the same. So the point is, he's making good progress here, and this is the part that gets him. So this morning, getting ready for work, he says he's headed out later, babe. Didn't hug and didn't kiss her because she had just rejected his advances the night before. She asked him if the sun is dressed. We have an agreement that if she lays out the clothes, I'll get them ready since she takes them to daycare. It's like, so she didn't lay it out. And he's like, no, I didn't. And then he leaves. She blows up. He goes, gets some clothes while saying, this is why I don't want to have, or she says that this is why we don't want to have sex, which is always funny, by the way. As soon as something like gets under a girl's feathers, they bring up this kind of stuff. It's literal chore play. You know, if you put the kids clothes out more, maybe we'd have sex more often. And I always kind of laugh when I see these ones because I'm like, you can tell you can tell when somebody's like not getting their way because that's the first response girls go to. So when you see Rolo tweeting those tweets about uh, the only the only agency a woman has is ultimately her sexuality and you can laugh and call it misogynist. But then you just see, yeah, I've seen this like 30 times, uh, <laughs> 30 times in the month. Every time I do something that's not whatever she wants, she throws it in my face. So he's not wrong. He is just a dick. <laughs> uh, so he dresses the kid, gives the kid a goodbye before he leaves. Or a hug goodbye. Sorry, I read it, read it wrong. So then he, she starts blowing up his phone, trying really hard to like you again, but you're making it very hard. You've really got to stop this hard ass attitude you have. I want nothing to do with it. Next text, like maybe if you go back to your sweet attitude, you'd get what you want. And I'm sorry I didn't have the clothes set out. I've been working my butt off cleaning every single room in the house by myself. Meanwhile, he's like, I got a new job. We're relocating. I've been handling things outside of the house. I'm busy as hell. Everybody's busy. And she's like, be grateful. So 10 minutes later, another text. Look, I'm sorry. You frustrate me so much with your hardness. I've calmed down now, but I'm being real. I don't like it at all. I wish you could find a happy medium. And then another text from like, you see this though, it's like 15 texts in there. I want to move and start new and fresh, but I don't want to be married to a dictator that's mean to his wife. Another text. And that's what you are. Another text. And if that's not something you're willing to work on with me, then let me know before I make decisions on where to work. And then 30 minutes later, he gets a phone call. And then some phone conversation. He's like, did you get those texts? He's like, you texted me? He's like, of course I read them, but he didn't tell her. By the way, that's important. She goes, yeah, I'm pissed off at you. And he goes, oh, you're mad? Well, I'll read them when I get to work. Yeah, I am. I worked really hard on getting the house ready to sell. And he's like, you've done great. And she has. So and then the conversation tone completely changes like nothing was ever bothering her. Responds to the text. Or responds back to the text with a meme of a picture of a guy about to grab an angry boob that says, 
uh, when she mad, but you're still going to touch them anyway. She starts laughing. So he's like, at first I was pissed about the texts, but then I reminded themselves those are her feelings, not mine. And what I would really lose if she left. And I'm not going to bring attention to her denying me because outcome independence. Did I handle this properly? So I'm going to get to the main part of this. There's two parts of this, but the part that I want to focus on that's not really addressed in this field report specifically is the texting. I have seen 100% examples of any guy who's ever had relationship problems, ever been in his girl's frame, has ever been uh, a floor mat and then kind of got his act together, even mine to some extent. I remember this. You start acting and we call it, it's like rational egoism. Learn it so you can forget it and start enjoying it. You start, you start giving a shit about yourself. You start treating yourself like the primary focus of your life because everybody else is doing that to them. So you might as well play the same game. You know, it's that Peterson thing. Like you got to play the iterative games. It's like in this case, yeah, it's like looking out for number one and then everybody else is number two. Put on your own mask for putting on everybody else's on the airplane, right? So it's kind of neat. Um, so all those texts, those are feelings. That's it. There's no real conversation to have here. And the problem with girls texting you their feelings is that you're seeing an open communication style so text there's no feelings in it no nothing it's just words you're getting the text there so you naturally want to respond with text back you start arguing very logical frontal lobe stuff but it's an emotional argument so all this does is it reinforces that she is uh higher on the status thing because you're either fighting against her emotions saying they're invalid which strengthens them in her mind if you don't believe me ask anybody in politics when you start arguing with the other side and how they just get more entrenched or you start trying to placate them in which case you also admit they have higher status just by the tone of your voice so just don't answer them and if you get grief about it this is not a bad answer it's like oh you sent them i didn't know easier answer for that is look if it's important it's face to face important i'll be home in a bit you set your tone, you set your boundaries, you realize there's no winning play, so the best move is just not to play at all. Uh, get to the next part, too. It's again, and then Jack's take on it was, uh, he's like, this isn't, this isn't OI at all. It's like, let's review. You take the outcome, you know, she has sex with you, and your actions, kiss and hug her goodbye, versus the other outcome, she doesn't have sex with you, and then you passive-aggressively leave to work and leave your kid in pajamas. It seems like your responses are very fucking dependent on the outcome, right? So I realize it's tough to grasp. I mean, first of all, in the long run, the idea of responding to getting value with giving value is essentially dependent. Don't be considerate to people who treat you shitty. Clearly, that's a dependent reaction in that your considerate behavior only manifests if you receive considerate behavior. But you won't accomplish much by turning that into a micro response to being turned down for sex. That's why we stress it. So if you act like you did immediately after getting rejected, then it just reinforces bad messages. You come off as butthurt. You make it easier for her to hamster that nothing she ever does is worthy of value, so she may as well stop. You make her think, oh, he wants sex, but I'm not really feeling it. But if I say no, he'll cry, which makes her avoid the situations of intimacy where you could even suggest it. And from there, it's a long road to men Googling, why is my wife so hateful, ending up in the red pill. Welcome. He's like, I get it. You understand this. That's why you posted this. I do think you handled the phone part well, which I agree with. But if you find yourself acting OI in an immediate response, but internally fuming, then think of your response in terms of going through the motions instead of doing the exact opposite effect of what I would do otherwise. So here's an example. Say you had plans to go to the movies. You initiate sex with the wife. She says no. You get frustrated. Do you cancel your plans? No. But you know, maybe there's less spark at the end of the night. You don't try to make much conversation at the car. You give mostly a muted opinion of the movie afterwards. She wants frozen yogurt. You're like, nah, I'm not really feeling it. And I got to be honest, as I'm writing it on, or as I'm writing this, I'm playing it on pretty thick, but I'm trying to describe how withdrawing your attention doesn't manifest as an immediate counter response, but as a sort of subtle degradation in your enthusiasm. Because if you do it right, she may show up 10 minutes later in some lingerie and say, how about you come to bed now? Pause here because I'm throwing my own little commentary here. Absolutely right, by the way. You would not believe how many field reports have a guy who finally learns 
Like he calibrates his outcome independence and his withdrawal of his uh, affection, attention, and commitment. And it ends up with responses like this. It's almost like you're, you're getting a shit test and you're passing it. And everybody gets those wrong. Everybody thinks a shit test is when a girl's shitting on you and it's not. A shit test is when a girl is feeling some attraction, but it's all like lizard brain stuff, limbic brain. And so her frontal lobe is trying to process it. So they throw out these little tests, bratty behavior, um, bitchy stuff, you know, testing to see if you're as like, as people would say, like the beta male. And if you pass that test, then she kind of like, it like creates a reinforcement feedback loop of attraction. And I know it sounds really weird and like artistic the way I put it there, <laughs> artistic with a soft R, but uh, it's true. So many times, my life, other people's life. Chick will get bratty. She'll start giving crap over text. You just ignore all that stuff. You keep doing your thing. You're not angry. You're not butt hurt. You're just kind of like the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy. And so for outcome independence, instead of these passive aggressive things, these snipes, you just start becoming apathetic. And I know it seems weird. It's like you shouldn't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. Once you got this stuff internalized, you're going to realize that's what you're naturally feeling anyway. When you want to smash, you and the wife, she shuts you down. Obviously, it doesn't feel great. Nobody likes getting turned down. Everybody gets that. But the natural, attractive way men respond to this is just kind of apathy. They kind of lose interest and they move on to do their own things. That's why I talk about, um, I call it the gym bag routine. It's an old thing about when a guy's are first learning to do his boundaries. Because like for this exact reason, they do some butthurt, passive-aggressive stuff. Go to the gym five o'clock every day, for example, at 4.30 or at 4.45, you have your gym bag packed, everything's there, it's by the door. You go and you try and smash. And if your wife shuts you down, you shrug your shoulders, go pick up your bag, go to your gym. You already had something better to do. You're establishing that if they want your attention or if she wants your attention, she has to provide value, but you're not dependent on it. You're not reactive to it. And I know it seems a little bit uh, contrived, but I mean, you have to be. That's how you practice things. It's training wheels. And then so happens that, you know, you guys end up smashing, having a great time. You still go to the gym anyway. But you see what I do, what you're doing here? You're detaching your dependence on the outcome from what you're trying to achieve here, which is happiness for yourself and a good relationship, all that stuff. And it's just, it's amazing to see it work and it's horrible to explain, but once it works, it's just amazing. Uh Back to Jack's thing. So he's like, this is, and the reason it's effective with women is because this is how they interact. You mentioned your wife has an emotional affair and I don't know, that was like an older field report. It's likely it was at least partially in response to your behavior. She'd probably argue over a legitimate issue. You'd get hostile and defensive and she'd just sigh and say, okay, sure, whatever. Let's just drop it. And any behavior has been cosmetically the same after each of those arguments, but there was always some subconscious reaction within her that eventually drove her away to the point where she found another man's attention appealing. So if you think your sex life is lackluster enough to be frustrated, then this is how it should manifest within you. The same sort of detached withdrawal, because just reflecting on what's happening is better. Anyways, you either detach to the point of divorce, or she finds you attractive enough to step up her frequency or enthusiasm. Your improvements will either make a difference or they'll benefit you when it comes time to separate and find yourself single again. And is it any more complicated than that? So I'll end on this point. He's like, and this is Jack and I agree 100% on this, which is, again, somewhat rare. Uh, it may help you to think about your life and marriage in this context. And in the meantime, as a minimum, maybe changing your kid out of pajamas in the morning shouldn't have a lot to do with this like that part too. separate the child raising from the sexual attraction stuff that's just a logistic issue so again and this is why a lot of guys don't like doing it this is what the fight is and it's because they're attached to something that doesn't exist a fiction they go well if i start getting despondent every time the girl starts shooting me down eventually what's going to happen is we're just going to drift apart and then divorce right and i go well here let me let me answer your question with another question if you guys are if you guys are so detached that you can't have a single conversation you haven't smashed in so long that you're basically not even friends or roommates, then maybe the marriage is already dead. Came up in the old uh, pickup stuff. They call it the two thirds rule. Text a girl two thirds as much as she texts you. I'm sure you guys have heard of it, and everybody always gets that same argument. Well, what happens then if I'm just not texting her at all? It's like, well, you think that 
that you killed the attraction, but the attraction was dead to begin with. So all that texting does is it helps you calibrate your investment based on the investment of the other person. Now, it almost never comes to this. That's why these are always hypothetical arguments against why it works. What happens is girls like attention. They like validation. They trade sex for it. That's kind of like the mating dance in a nutshell. Guys are horny. Girls are lonely. And once you start putting a value, a price on, on your attention, on your validation, she starts treating it as worthwhile. It's all limbic brain. This is not overly like, you know, nobody's Machiavellian and calculating this stuff. I mean, you kind of are now, but you get the point. And so all you're doing is the parts of you that are attractive. You're making her work for them. Girls like a challenge. Same way that a guy likes a challenge. When you go pick up a girl, some of the most fun parts about it are that that anxiety of not knowing. Is it, is it a yes? Is it a no? I'm not sure. That uncertainty there. Very attractive for a guy. That's why guys love strange. Never thought about that from a girl's perspective, though, did you? Girls love it, too. And so you're kind of not only training yourself to start respecting the things about you that are valuable, the things about you that are attractive, you also stop acting unattractive and you start gaining outcome independence. So I hope you take that from this and I hope you understand the point of it. And on that point, I'll catch you guys on the next one. Cheers.